You know these uh, people who are going to speak to us tonight, and you know our main speaker very well. But I'd like to have two people, uh, Bill Larson and Gene Myron, do a little bit of a prelude to our main speaker tonight. You all know Bill. He's been uh, 40 years Poly International. I know you know him well. He's actually been knighted, so we could call him Sir William when you see him tonight. Uh, Gene Myron. Uh, as all of you know, in 2008 was very res well was majorly responsible, uniquely responsible for the American Treasures exhibit, which was a wonderful year. And in 2004, also received the Carnegie Award, which uh, helps us all out. Uh, it recognizes his contribution to what helps us all out so much in our hobby with minerals. So, please let me bring up first, uh, give a warm welcome to Gene Myron. Well, it's a true pleasure to be here tonight to talk about uh, Mr. Swoboda, who I met a number of years ago and uh, have admired for much longer than that. So we are here tonight to talk about Edward Roy Swoboda, and I put together some photos that will help you get acquainted with, uh, with Ed. This is one of the earlier photos uh, with Ed, with the uh, one famous one, the Wamanoa tree in uh, Yosemite about 1930. This is Ed sitting in front of the of the car there. Uh, but as you know, Ed is, how old are you? It's important to know because this is a slice of that tree. <laughs> and I put some notable characters on there to tell you where they're from. Archimedes <laughs> is roughly at that time. Leonardo da Vinci is roughly there. I did not count. The, if for the scientists in the room, I did not count out the tree rings exactly. This is an approximation. <laughs> Benjamin Franklin, I think that that's fitting. And of course, in the latter part of the ring, there's Ed Swoboda. <laughs> so we now have a true mark of the, uh, the relevance of uh, Ed Swoboda in major uh, uh, history. The next slide shows Ed uh, at the Benito A. Gem Mine. He was very famous for doing the work at the Benito A. Gem Mine. And there is Ed with a rifle and a hawk. And it's important to note that that hawk was seen high grading some of the material there. <laughs> <laughs> and there is Ed, just with a cactus, Superior, 1936. Ed and Peter Bancroft were loading dynamite in this slide in order for Ed to go to uh, Brazil. I think it was around the 1930s or something like that. And this is a very famous slide. It's been, been well known. What you don't know, and you probably have not seen before, is the sequel to the slide taken seven seconds later. <laughs> Fortunately for the mineral community, com collecting community, Ed survived this blast. Here is Ed with Nate Waxman, where he started up some of his jewelry business and uh, Kunjas. Uh, about what time, about what year was this? Roughly in the 50s? Yeah. And uh, with Anne Bancroft when she was making a movie in the 1953 time frame where some of Ed's jewelry. So it's to note that uh, Ed had a lot of other interests besides the mineral collecting. The jewelry was a very, very, very fine business with Ed. 
One of the most important things is what happened in World War II. In World War II, the United States was at war with Japan and with Germany and uh, the Axis powers. And uh, the battlefield troops needed ways of communication. And that was through the thing called the walkie-talkie. And what was happening is that the coordination of the oscillations of the communications devices depended on quartz crystals. And one of Ed's great contributions during the war was to search out the quartz crystals that could be sliced into these oscillators to be used. And over 50 million of these devices were made during the war. And they were as important to the winning of the war as indeed was things like the atomic bomb. And indeed, I come from the semiconductor industry uh, for many, many years. And this is really the first instance of starting up the semiconductor industry. And one of the comments made by uh, Gerald Holton of Harvard University uh, was that it will prove to be a tale of one of the war's greatest achievements. No less significant will be the fruit of these advancements to a new world at peace where crystals will be the vibrating hearts of most telecommunications equipment. And of course, that is still true today. And this is one of the great unknown stories of uh, Ed Soboda and his con contribution to the history uh, at this crucial time. Some other things, this is uh, when Ed uh, started collecting with uh, Wayne Thompson in the San Francisco mine. I was honored to be part there and uh, go down into this wondrous, clean, air-conditioned, <laughs> bejeweled mine, uh, San Francisco. <laughs> anyway, that was just one of the collecting trips. Just a picture at the Westwood Look Show a number of years ago, and of course, Dave Wilbur here in the foreground. And at the American Treasure, at the American Mineral Treasures Show in uh, 2008, uh, the museums brought in the famous uh, rock, and so there's the American Mineral Treasure Show with the icon. And I'm not the icon, it's the candelabra. <laughs> so if we were to put together Ed's history, there's a history of jewelry making, very, very, very wonderful jewelry. There's a history during World War II of helping find the quartz crystals that helped win World War II. There is a large number of specimens in the world that were collected by Ed of, of major specimens, but specimens that could be provided for all the collections in the museums and the collectors, many thousands of specimens that were a result of, uh, of Ed Swoboda's uh, pioneering uh, collecting activities. There were the great finds of very, very rare minerals, many of these, uh, uh, probably too numerous to name here, but for example, the Armievite uh, that Ed collected. And of course, Ed is highly famous for the things such as the icons. And these are the main reasons, the five main reasons why we talk about Ed Swoboda and why we are having this evening tonight. So there is Edward Roy Swoboda. Ed, would you come up here for a moment? It's not often that one is able to do this, but I want to introduce you to an old friend, OK? You all know of the American Mineral Treasures and the showing of all the famous blue caps. This is one of the blue caps that you have not seen previously, and I don't think that Ed has seen Nor it in a I. good long yeah. time. Ed? This is one of the things that has not been seen for 40 years. Well, I wanted to put a lot of stuff in the Del Mar Fair, and I heard of the judge who was coming down, one of the judges was Ed Swoboda. And I knew that he was amazing because he had a one inch tanzanite. And this is 1968, guys. <laughs> this is really early on for Tanzan. I was found in 1967, 68. And I mean, that was like amazing. And so he came in, he judged our things, and I, I got beat on a thumbnail collection that I had won three years in a row over the same guy that beat me. And I knew he was a friend of Ed's. And I went over as Albert McMacken, and I confronted Ed, and he was extremely courteous and pointed out why I should have been beat all three times. And it was. <laughs> 
<laughs> and it was really a problem because the first prize was $35 and the second prize was $25. It cost me $10. So <laughs> it was really funny. And we got to talk and he, and he saw my herderite. He said, wow, that's really something. He knew rare minerals. He still knows rare minerals, like the Armiavites. So he taught me rare minerals through, you know, the appreciation of like the herderite I had found. He, he invited me up, he told me, he says, look, I just bought the Stuart mine, which was, you know, amazing. He had purchased it. He says, come up, bring your herderite. You love thumbnails. I'll give you a couple, three thumbnails, and so you can beat that guy again next year. <laughs> so, so, of course, I was on a draft notice, so that wasn't uh, fun. And he, he, he was really kind, and I went up to uh, uh, Kumja and Ed's place, and he brought out some wonderful thumbnails, one of which had come from Martin Ehrman. It was a beautiful gold specimen. And we did this exchange uh, with the herderite, and it was very fair. And he spun a tail. He says, why don't we create a mineral business? Uh, you know, you can travel the world. I'll come with, you know, we'll do things. And he knew Martin Ehrman. In fact, he was Martin Ehrman's landlord. <laughs> so, and I got to meet Martin Ehrman, another great legend. And Martin was extremely fine, wonderful man. And so he said, yeah, yeah, you know, it's time for new people coming in, and let's do this. And we went through a couple of guys. And then we found, through Josie Scripps, we found John McLean. And Ed liked him, I liked him. And he worked for very little money. In fact, I paid him my Volkswagen Beetle, I think, for, for <laughs> like a year's, a year's help. And, and Ed, actually, while I was in the military, he and Skippy Zenix, another amazing legend, they found the old tourmaline at it. You can read about that in, in the Lapidary Journal. It's really a fantastic story. Ed deserves credit because everybody thought it was lost forever. And it turned out it was real. It wasn't a, a, just a mystery story. The, the Stuart mine was extremely rich. It didn't produce wonderful tourmalines, and these are old, old slides. But pockets like this, we were finding literally dozens of pockets. And they were mostly explosively, you know, maybe explosively released or whatnot, because very few great crystals. I only knew crystal. I didn't know much about cutting material uh, or, or faceted stones. And I only like to sell crystals. Well, out of a pocket like this, you could probably sell less than $100, because <laughs> nothing was terminated. And Ed was always there, kind of, you know, amazing what he could dig. So he would teach, you know, along the way. We got to take a trip to Africa. Ed, Ed designed a trip. We started in Germany. We went to Portugal. We went to Spain. We went to, uh, let's see, in, in order, to South Africa, to Angola, where I got amoebic dysentery. That was wonderful. <laughs> to Mozambique, <laughs> uh, back to Colombia, down to Chile. Uh, and it was like amazing. So I'd heard, you know, Afrikaans and Swahili, and I gave up my French. You know, it was like, you know, I, I'll speak bad English. And it was amazing. I mean, Ed just was, had this ability to, to show you things. So we got into Mozambique and we bought, the only thing that paid for the trip for our point of view was we bought three kilos of tourmaline rough for about $1,400, which I was sold for the next three years for about uh, probably 10 times the money. So I learned about cutting. I learned about this and that, thanks to Ed. And then he said, you know, the Stuart mine's going. We're doing some things. Let's go up to the Queen mine. Well, bulldozers ho, John McLean ho, uh, here we go. Most modern equipment we could release, uh, you know, it was amazing. And there it was. This is 1971. Uh, that was the old way that we just sort of cleaned it out. And then we brought in bulldozers and worked it back as far as you could. And you know, there's the door. There's the, everything ready to go in. And we had to put, Bryant Harris deserves a huge thanks because he put in all the welding and the concrete with, jo with John McLean. So we left. Ed and I left on that trip I just described to you. And Ed had pointed out very carefully he wanted to go down here where Dick Johns had told us, and we all agreed, all of us high graders. And I used to, John Sinkankas was high grade. I knew John since I was 14. He used to high grade there. We all knew where we should go, straight down. So John goes, and we leave. And we come back, and he hit the first blue cap pocket, which had one blue cap in it. We called Ed, and he drove all the way down from Beverly Hills. We worked it out, and it nothing. You know, there, there it was. There was no more blue caps. And then we, we went for about another couple of days, and you can read about it, and we'd hit another pocket, and he comes down from Beverly Hills, and, uh, you know, we're trying again. And I think it was about the third try, Ed finally got to dig Mini, and I got to dig Mini. It was amazing. We, we'd each dig one. I remember Dave Wilbur came up during the thing, and we teased him because we said, I guess Dave will like ice cream here. And, of course, <laughs> you have ice cream? <laughs> we probably did, knowing Ed. 
and uh, he was so great. This is a, the, a, the only picture I found with their friend, Maud Engbert, which I think they've not seen for years. This is Kum Jai on the right, and Ed. This is 1972, November, and we worked that pocket of the blue caps. There was probably really three major pockets that had the big ones in it, like the rabbit ears and the, uh, the candelabra and whatnot. And these are the things, the sites that Ed saw. These are blue caps. And what's amazing is we were selling these for like $500 for one like that. And I saw one sell here for $150,000. It's just like that. <laughs> it's a true story. I mean, it's like, holy crap. <laughs> you just can't comprehend time and what certain rarities and what certain things. Well, even my friends in Europe, I mean, Marcus Boudil has excellent taste. Uh, he doesn't get blue caps, you know. Danny got blue caps. <laughs> you know, you read about these things. But they're right, you know. The Europeans didn't grow up with them. We grew up with them. And Ed did a great part. And here's Josie Scripps, our friend. And there's uh, where the ocean view is, right over here. Jeff Swanger's putting in enormous work. And he's a great friend of Ed. Ed goes up there and shows him where to dig a little bit. And there's Jose relaxing. And there we are. That's fashion mavens, baby. Uh, <laughs> There's the candelabra, and there's the belly button, which is in Peter Vias collection. This is in the collector house, and uh, I think that's 1972, and that was the day that Paul Desitels, Peter Embry, and everybody who was anybody was there. So, Ed, you are a magnificent man. Let me introduce you. It's your speech. <laughs> Bancroft and I met in uh, Glendale, California, and um, we uh, had a science teacher when we finally went to high school that uh, uh, told us that uh, he was one of six people uh, that had rediscovered the Benitoite uh, property, which had been kind of lost over a period of 40 or 50 years after they uh, discontinued work on it. And um, we, we, we pestered him very much to get permission to visit the property which he obtained from the widow of uh, the, Mrs. Dallas. And the, um, as, as, as the teacher was going on vacation, we, we'd go up there, we went up there like five years in a row during summer vacation spending a couple of weeks each time. Uh, we uh, hiked, started hiking up the canyon and we didn't really know exactly where the, where the trail was that was leading up to the top of the range. But we got several lifts from local residents and um, finally someone that knew about the trail and they let us off right there. And so it took us two days to get to the top of the range and we had about 85 pound sacks that we were carrying up there. It was really tough on us in the beginning because our legs were not accustomed. And uh, the second day it was not as bad as the first and so on. And finally we got hardened into it so that we could, uh, we could handle long walks with, with these packs. And so the, about the second uh, uh, day, uh, we followed the, San Benito, the source of the San Benito River downstream. And uh, that uh, evening, as we were coming around a bend, here was the old cabin that had been described to us, which we occupied uh, during that uh, uh, the, the two weeks or so that we were working on the property. And I think we were the first ones to get into any of the, uh, do any type of mining, including checking out of the dump uh, where the, uh, er, the former workers had been throwing their, their benedoite. Uh, material uh, in, in a haphazard sort of manner. And so um, the Benitoite is found um, primarily uh, with a covering of natrolite, which can be removed, we found out in due time, by dilute hydrochloric acid. And if you uh, can control it with like beeswax around the edges, you can get just a perfect kind of a, of a removal of this coating so that uh, the bumps that uh, turn into the benedoite crystals and or uh, the dark red uh, neptunite crystals that are associated with them. Um, there, there was a small dump that the workers had uh, 
piled their material on when they're mining in the slope of the hill. And we uh, f felt proud that we'd not left one rock unturned. And we spent two or three days working our way up to the top of the little uh, um, level of this dump. And in the course of uh, going up there, we were finding all kinds of specimens with the uh, crystals being coated with the white neutralite that indicated that it was either benetolite or neptunite under the surface. And there was one uh, rock that um, uh, was about 20 inches in size that with a, with a uh, prospecting hammer, I was hammering on it for some while until I got exhausted. And the hammer would just sink into the soft uh, uh, part of the rock, which was serpentine, and no sign of the inch thick vein of uh, natural light uh, parting until finally the, a little crack showed up and eventually uh, the rock split in two parts, uh, out of which came some flawless fragments of benetolite. And uh, those were uh, later cut and uh, produced a five carat, uh, a four and a half carat stone and a, and a three, and a 4.05 carat stone, which are pretty large for benetolite at that time. And this is uh, showing us some of the big stones. It's in packing up our loot for, for getting down in the mountain, we realized that we had way more of material than we could possibly carry. And so we had to cache some in some spot. And so behind the cabin, a couple hundred feet, we dumped a couple of hundred pounds of material, which in succeeding years, we filled our bags to bring down also. And um, we were, uh, at the last moment on this, on this trip, uh, having a terrible time, and you can see uh, just some of the material that's scattered on this table and so on, that uh, the, uh, we couldn't possibly leave behind this little specimen, nor could we this one. And so we just kept stacking on and on and not realizing what we were actually doing. And so when we first tried to get up after packing, tie, tying down the, the bags, we couldn't even get up there so heavy. And so uh, the, the first uh, couple of miles, were, it was assumedly mostly downhill, but it wasn't all the way downhill. We'd go through valleys and then rise and then drop. And so we eventually uh, got down to the valley where in our front was the little town of Kolinga. And uh, we uh, really, uh, it was three days of, of hiking with these heavy packs. And we, uh, out of curiosity, weighed them. And there was only a one pound uh, difference in the weight of the two bags. And they were 112 and 113 pounds. And we went 18 miles bringing these darn things down the hill. So you can tell I love specimens. I see now I made a mistake and I, I should have mentioned this total layout of the needle. I it was over a period of years of, of cleaning with acid, the little stones would drop out that were cutters. And I eventually cut all these, and I forget, it was like 45 stones that were over a carrot in there, which is pretty unusual for benetolite. And my daughter, Samia, who's sitting here in front of me, uh, made this layout of seven uh, necklaces uh, that uh, each of which could be a pretty fantastic, unusual piece of jewelry. And so there, that's being, that's over in Rod Levinsky's uh, uh, room that Brian uh, brought over for the, for the show that if anyone's interested, they could go over and look at. In addition to the Benitoite, we uh, would uh, visit my dad's my parents' uh, cabin, which we had down around near Rincon in San Diego County. And uh, we uh, took a claim out on a property that uh, was called the Clark Mine. It was in Rincon. And it was a very steep climb out of the riverbed to get up there. And we started finding very nice, light, smoky quartz, most of which had 
a, a spray of very bright green epidotes on the surface. And then fi the final of that pocket was one crystal that was, I couldn't lift it, it was, it was heavier than I could lift, and I think Pete just barely did. And it was over 200 pounds, and it was like 20 by 20 by 20 inches, or maybe 24 inches, something like that. And uh, we figured, well, how are we gonna get this down the mountain? And we did our best tying all kinds of things around and wrapping it up and so on. But after the first 10 feet, I think it got away from us. And it went bounding and then it got airborne. <laughs> and we were looking down this steep, like 60, 70 degree thing to the bottom of the San Luis Rey River. And there happened to be a giant outcropping of granite with one point sticking up where it made a direct hit. And it was like an explosion. And fragments went hither and yon and wherever. And we, the, the one that we, we found several of the fragments only, but the one fragment that uh, had the best material in it, we traded to Grieger's, that was a mineral company in, in Pasadena. And uh, later, Don, uh, John Grieger uh, uh, had a sphere cut out of this. And as you, many of you probably know, a clear rock crystal sphere of over like three and a half inches that is without any defects is kind of rare. And this turned out to be a five incher. And so that was really exciting for them, not for us. So. Now, this next is uh, my travels to Brazil. Pete and I were, were both uh, planning to go there, but he happened to find Virginia and that was that with him. And so I didn't have anybody to go with down there but myself. And uh, that was uh, in 1933, something of that uh, time period when Hitler was uh, uh, taking over most of Europe. And uh, I, when I think it was when he finally took over Poland, I figured, God, here go my chances to uh, ever go down and see Brazil, which, Turn, which in my mind was uh, the uh, storehouse of gems. And there are uh, a few places that we'll probably all know of that like uh, uh, Mozambique and like uh, 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 the, 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 the Republic of Madagascar and all that, that are just amazing for what they can produce and so on. And so I figured, well, I've got to, at least get my one last uh, uh, trip down there before I become what, what we commonly call cannon, cannon fodder then. And so I dropped out of school, I was out of college, and uh, went to uh, work in a grocery store uh, at $27 a week uh, for a couple of years. And, uh, until I, and then my dad helped me uh, to uh, get passage on a passenger freighter going to Brazil and it was a 17 day trip. And I drove down to New Orleans in my Model A Ford and when there was a gasoline war going on and so I could buy it at nine cents a gallon. <laughs> there was something we don't even want to think of now. And so um, I, I, in, in route I became acquainted with a, uh, another guy about my same age, Ike Mahoney. And uh, uh, he was going down to see his brother who worked in the uh, consulate of, in Rio de Janeiro. And uh, so when we arrived in Rio, we went into some, to a pension uh, that was on, uh, I think it was on the border of Ipanema and in Copacabana. We, we moved into these uh, very small rooms, but with wonderful food available at uh, like $30 a month kind of deal. And uh, we met a, a, an American freelance explorer who was just in for his R&R &R from the Matagosa jungle. And uh, his name is Doc Daverin, uh, Alexander Daverin. And, and Doc uh, uh, talked us into, which was not difficult at all, into paying him 200 bucks each and we guaranteed that we'd each get a Jaguar uh, by going on an expedition with him into 
of Bolivia. And so um, uh, we spent uh, several, um, it was like three months, and then I had to come back home, and at the same time, uh, Davran asked me if I wanted to continue on with him, and I said, sure, I'd like to. On this uh, stay that I made, I spent 15 months in the Mato Grosso jungle, and he had a, a young Indian that um, was from a tribe of bearded Indians, the only tribe of bearded Indians in South America, that had stopped, that had come down river to a ranch and learned Portuguese. And at the same time, the, the Portuguese uh, the rancher's way of uh, su surviving and so on. And he and I got to be friends. And they, there's a, uh, an area that uh, uh, hyacinth macaws are found in, which I understand are the rarest of all the macaws, and there are quite a few different uh, subspecies and so on. But those are com all of one color. And I was sent up in, 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 by a block and tackle up 40 feet to uh, some of the branches of the, uh, uh, of the hardwood trees that had these holes probably dug by woodpeckers in which were the baby uh, macaws. And we'd have to wait in the early morning, we'd wait until the parents would take off because they could murder you, they could chop you all up if uh, you tried to go there when they were around. And so well, after they'd left in a small swarm, uh, I went up there with a gloved hand. I got eight of these baby uh, hyacinth macaws uh, for Doc. And at the same time, he had a, uh, a jungle, a guy that lived in the jungle, a Brazilian guy, uh, watching a, a huge tree uh, uh, were in, it was a huge nest that harbored a, uh, a harpy eagle. And harpy eagles are the largest of any eagles in the Americas. And um, it's a long story that this guy didn't realize that uh, that it's not the beak that is dangerous, it's the claws. And so he ensnared the, the bird uh, and, and safely had, <clears throat> had the head uh, in one position and he walked up to get the bird and he had, and the bird just clawed a four, a four month old bird and the claw went completely through his hand and came out the upper side. And uh, he had a big bandage around that when he brought it in. And uh, I, I was the uh, mother on, on that little bird, and uh, I learned it, it has a, a very high uh, whistle that kind of drops a couple of uh, chords below. And so he got used to that call when I'd be near camp, and then he'd be all excited looking for his, for his meal. And then coming, coming back to um, America, um, I came up the East Coast and, uh, and I <clears throat> went over to the Bronx Zoo where this uh, harpy eagle had been uh, sold and was uh, on display. And when I got there, he was in the very upper reaches of a gigantic cage and paying no attention, attention to anyone. And it was loaded with uh, visitors and so on. And I stood back of all those people and uh, made, a, made the kind of whistle that he became used to. And immediately he came to attention and he was looking down and he kind of made me feel sad as I left there that uh, such a magnificent bird is in captivity like that. And then finally in the, uh, in, in the BBC radio, it, we received news on, on the war front where Hitler was still in uh, invading countries in Europe, we uh, got a, a, an amazing message that America had been attacked by the Japanese in some place that I'd never heard of. It was called Pearl Harbor. And so uh, the very next night, uh, the embassy personnel were uh, on all the radio stations, including the BBC, telling any Americans of a certain age to come in and register and fill out forms and so on like that. And so it took us like over two months before we could get all this 
live stuff, and then I had been collecting uh, for the Smithsonian uh, bird skeletons, a skeleton of every male and female species of bird in, in Brazil. And so I had about 2,200 of those that were dipped in at that time in arsenic and then uh, allowed to dry after I had removed the major muscles off the animal. And so uh, that all came into town and then the next day I went in to uh, see the uh, uh, consulate and uh, I followed their instructions and, and so they asked me uh, uh, several questions and uh, they uh, wanted to know uh, what my background was of education. I said, well, I, I was uh, majoring in geology, but then I dropped out of school. And they said, well, do you speak Portuguese? And I said, yes, fairly well. And so they said, okay, you're gonna, you gotta stay here because we've got a lot of Americans coming down. They're going to be in search of uh, war materials such as mica, rock crystal, and some of the heavy metals, uh, root seal included that um, re require someone to help them in setting up camps in the interior. And so I spent quite some time doing that. But the first man that I met, uh, 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 a geologist, was uh, William Picora. And uh, Bill and I became pretty, pretty close friends. And his, his uh, mission was completely different from, warm, from all of those war materials that the that the major geologists were down looking for. And he was, at, he was out to check their uh, nickel silicate uh, uh, locality in the state of Goyaz. And so we spent uh, several months, five, four or five months there. And he taught me many things like making maps with the, with the Brunton compass and so on. And uh, uh, other features of uh, to become a a good jazzies, and he asked me if I wanted to continue there, and I kindly refused because I just had other plans in mind. And so Bill later became the head of the USGS and Undersecretary of Interior, and uh, he's no longer with us. He probably put too much uh, overload on his work program. My longest period of working in the Brazilianite property was about uh, six weeks, and I stayed. Uh, uh, up, up uh, a little ranch house of Raimundinos, <clears throat> where he was farming and just b <clears throat> barely making out in the upland jungle. I had the opportunity to dig in two of the, uh, of the two uh, pegmatites that were producing the crystals. And what had happened prior to my arrival is that the crystals being of a yellow color and of a certain crystal form made most of the people that were digging them think that they were chrysoberyl. And chrysoberyl was a major stone that was always in demand. And so they uh, mined out what they could mine out and sold it to the major lapidaries in the capital of, 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 uh, of Brazil, to the lapidaries. And then they found that their carborundum wheels just ruined everything, uh, that, uh, that it was a different mineral entirely and uh, very, very much softer than chrysoberyl. And so I got out in my digging quite a few uh, nice little crystals and, and a couple of nice twins and so on. And one piece of kind of water-worn, a giant crystal that I succeeded in getting about a 30 carat flawless stone out of uh, and uh, uh, did uh, about all the work that I felt could be done in order to uh, uh, pay, pay for my being up there. And then in the process of uh, this life, Fred Poe heard about the uh, uh, some new mineral from Brazil and he came down and was told that uh, uh, that the kind of vague information about where the property was and so on. And uh, he finally, and then I, I met him and, and told him that I had uh, obtained the property because in Brazil a foreigner can't have any mining property unless it's owned by a, a, a Brazilian partner. 
And so um, he uh, uh, got some samples from me, took them back to the States, and did his analysis on them, and uh, gave them the, the name of Brazilianite. And that, that was my Brazilian story. And then uh, we dug in uh, uh, some quartz um, properties, and uh, my personal feeling about ex really fine minerals is that it can be it could be like a calcite, and you could have six or eight different specimens, each from a different place that would be unique, and that, therefore it would qualify as being a, a, a world beater kind of thing, and that would be the same in. in uh, I would think that, that same thinking would apply to quartz, which uh, produces with pyridohedron pyrite crystals inside, sometimes up to enormous size, and uh, uh, twin uh, uh, Japan law twins, uh, it's, and uh, with rutile inclusions and so on. And so, this one property that we're working that was Japan law. Uh, I, before getting started there, I had purchased from uh, Fred a, for a very small amount of money a, a beat up crystal that wasn't of any use as a specimen, but it was so huge I couldn't put my hands down from taking it and he didn't charge me very much for it. Uh, we're working this one property in, in a place called Cerro de Cabral in western Minas Gerais and uh, uh, the workers brought a, a piece of refuse that had been thrown out uh, of a tunnel that they'd, someone before had, had dug. And here's this giant, it's like a 10 inch uh, or more crystal of, uh, of uh, twin uh, J Japan law quartz, which is all exciting. And so it turned out that we uh, uh, did further digging in there. And then we started finding some really nice stuff. And we have, uh, some uh, 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 there's one uh, transparent uh, piece that had a larger size uh, of the twin than on, uh, on one side than on the other, and here it is. It's like 14 and a half inches, and uh, to me, it's like a world record for size. I don't know, but they got several out that that were of that that kind of size. Now I'm going to Africa. Uh, in French Equatorial Africa, uh, there's a mineral company in California called Berminco, and uh, I knew George Berm Berman, and he was in that part of the world, and he had gone there to the Dioptes locality, but had found some just very small pieces of insignificant value. But uh, the only Dioptes at that time that was coming out in Dioptes, as you probably all know, is a beautiful mineral. It could be transparent crystals of uh, emerald green, uh, I guess uh, uh, copper silicate, uh, hydroxyl or whatever, that um, were being taken out of uh, uh, a couple of the major mines in, in Africa, but only uh, when, uh, the, when the owners of the property weren't looking because the workers would put it in a basket or a bag or something and bring it out and from a depth of a couple of thousand feet. And so uh, going to this locality was a little bit difficult and I was lucky that when I stopped on the, on the uh, Congo River that uh, I met a, uh, a Frenchman that was a big game hunter that uh, was waiting for his next client and while he was waiting, he had a couple of weeks, and so he took over and he had a couple of Jeeps, and one of them was a, like a kitchen, an uh, ambulating kitchen. And so we went up there, he could speak the language and so on, and uh, uh, it worked beautifully. And so I uh, was examining one area where declining tunnels were going down to the, the uh, copper vein, uh, and uh, there are little beanlets in the soft uh, dirt on that uh, was uh, on the on the surface of the uh, of the uh, of, of the outcrop, 
and uh, where they would join, it could bulge out into a nice uh, piece of, of very interesting uh, diaptase. And so I found a vein that went for like four or five feet uh, that uh, was crystallized on both sides. The lower side was uh, not uh, too much inclusion, but the upper side was fabulous and bright and beautiful. In those days, fine specimens were of little value. And so I was getting, even then, that were like fifty, seventy-five hundred dollar $7,500 specimens. And I was just beside myself with joy, figuring, oh, that's going to be a lot of problems. And uh, then uh, the Frenchman uh, signaled me, said, what, where can I dig or what can I do? And I said, well, why don't you dig right back over there? It was a few, like 50 feet from where I was um, in the same line of outcrop of the vein. And he and a couple of black guys were digging there and they came up with this chunk of not too interesting looking diaptase. It had no crystal showing on it. And it was about eight inches or a foot by two feet. And uh, this is a kind of a real stupid thing I did in my life that I, he asked me, what do I do now? And I said, well, Hit it with a hammer and see what happens. And there's nothing but a, but a, a solid interior of crystals of diaptase, including one beautiful uh, uh, stalactite. And uh, the be one of the best specimens, I think, is this one shown that uh, for a long time, maybe still, was going out around on a pedestal in Smithsonian. And Daptase is a really beautiful thing that catches everybody's eye. And so um, uh, the, the uh, Frenchman that uh, was in control of the mines at that time, uh, having, with the help of this uh, 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 big game hunter, eventually broke down and said, well, there's no Daptase. And, and he knew exactly what I was looking for. And I said, well, if I do find any, uh, I'll be happy to leave some with you. And so I left five of these woven bags with protected specimens of really fine doptes with them. And I almost got kissed on both cheeks on that one. So now I'm getting down to the Terminating Queen mine. This mine, the purchase of the property, first involved my going underground. And uh, it was through a broken mass of pegmatite to reach uh, the, de the, uh, the innermost uh, workings, which was roughly north of the portal. And it was several hundred feet, but it was up, down, and around, and so, down, and up, and so on. And I had a flashlight, and I'd flash it on stubs of black tourmaline and on the pit light and so on. And then I'd turn the light off, sit down, and figure out, now, what the hell does that mean? And so on. And so I started uh, finally getting a feeling because the size of black tourmaline is an indicator in many cases, and especially in, in the pala pegmatites, that you're near a good pocket when you find something of a certain size. And so um, we... Uh, uh, I, I, I was planning to take Bill on, on a trip around outside of the country, and uh, we had uh, John McLean uh, doing some the mining work, and, and so I took John underground and said, look, John, uh, this north side of the tunnel has got some oversized uh, shorals, the black tourmaline, and it, and it looks to me like that, that could be the best thing. And we had found uh, a pocket that was about an inch and a half by a two inch uh, crystal, not too good, but at least it was something showing on that side. And so he worked for a month and a half, and the day before we returned, and Bill and I went through Africa and South America and so on, uh, he, when he cleaned off the face of the tunnel, there was a very thin veinlet of lipidolite that was an eighth of an inch thick only on the uh, west side. On the east side, it was a quarter of an inch, which anyone would figure, well, we'll go where the he heavier is. 
And that's true, that, I, that that wasn't a difficult decision. But the exciting thing about this was something that I'd never brought up. I, I don't think I ever even mentioned this to Bill, is that uh, Lepidolite mica, and I found this out in Brazil, Lepidolite mica, when it changes from a violet color to a, to a pinkish shade, you're in for something really good. And so, uh, we, I, I had uh, uh, them, I had uh, John make a, a shortcut through there, and then the next day he said, you gotta, I, I went home and I came back down again, he said, you gotta come up and look at what I've done. And sure enough, there was a small pocket in front of us that uh, looked like uh, it might have something in it. There were all the signs like shore oil, big shore oils up above. And most of the fine stuff out of the, out of the blue cap pocket came out of the roof. And with the exception of a few pieces that were down and had formed down at a lower level. But uh, the, uh, it's within about a half a mile of the uh, of, of the uh, giant fault line there. And over 65 million years, who knows how many earthquakes uh, have shaken this up. And those crystals that were coming out of the roof, when they snapped off from the shaking, fell down into a secondary mud of, of red iron oxide that had nothing to do with pocket mud, but it was a very soft base to receive these fabulous crystals that broke off from their, from their roots, so to speak. And so uh, the first, the first uh, indication of something good that was to come was the fact I, I'm pretty sure I dug it out. It was a, a single blue cap that was uh, about uh, a little over two inches in thick and about uh, five inches long and we all started yelling. And so there was some obstruction of quartz in uh, perthite, uh, feldspar, uh, that would that made it look like it was a small pocket. And I said, John, put in a half stick uh, on that stuff. I got to go home. I'm tired. And so I took off, and it took me two hours to get home. <clears throat> By the time when I just walked in the door, the phone was ringing, and that was John. He says, "You got to come back." And so back I went, and we worked till four o'clock in the morning. And we took out some, some of this amazing stuff that is being shown here or that you already know about. Oh, there's two new pieces uh, of, the, uh, of the Queen Mine that have just come to the market. And it's taken about a decade. It was about a decade after the first discovery of these blue caps. And um, those, are, those two probably represent the uh, last major pocket that ever came out of the Queen. And I'd like to show you a couple of specimens from that pocket. And this is one called Six Pack because of six fabulous crystals on the same piece of matrix. And, uh, ooh. And then the second piece, uh, which is of smaller crystals, is personally my favorite for one main reason, that uh, it's not only aesthetically beautiful and pleasing, but uh, this is presented to me by my son Brian on my 94th birthday, which is not too long ago. And uh, both of these are in a display case up here, and invi we invite all of you to come and view them. Right now, that's the end of Ed's presentation, and we invite one Thank you. you. sponsored by the Mineralogical Record, the first one we've ever sponsored. Uh, it was inspired by an idea uh, from uh, Gene Myron. We put together a selection committee and we all agreed that uh, it should be the first recipient. I'll read you what it says. The American Mineral Heritage Award presented to Edward R. Sobota for field collecting achievements contributing to the heritage of American mineral specimens. Uh, it is, in essence, a lifetime achievement award for field collecting. 
Uh, I can't think of anyone who deserves it more, Ed. Congratulations. Oh, thank you very much. Thank you. I'm overwhelmed. I, I, I just, they never told me exactly uh, who, what kind of an award and so on. And this is mainly from the man that was just here. I think this is all his work of putting together this beautiful award. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Here. I was wondering, what was your wife doing when you were running around doing all this stuff? <laughs> Did you hear the question? Well, what what was mom doing when you were running around the world uh, hunting minerals? You can't believe what she's gone through. <laughs> uh, she's a, a fabulous uh, cook, and she, uh, around the home, she does such things that I, I'm still at wonder, and we're, we're only married 48 years now, <laughs> and two more to go to hit the big 50. And uh, I've disappointed her in the beginning when I was collecting so much, where she just get together enough to pay the rent or something. I'd say, honey, I gotta have 1,200 bucks. I gotta buy this specimen, <laughs> which uh, now is uh, priced a little bit higher, like a million two hundred thousand. <laughs> Yeah. I know all your collecting adventures have not been uh, pleasant uh, walks through the, the park. Do you want to share some of the, the most dangerous or the, or the most uh, seriously threatening situations that you've been in in your collecting experiences? He wants to know what's the most dangerous or threatening experience you had while collecting minerals. Which one he's thinking of, I'm sure. <laughs> Actually, uh, the, danger, the danger of collecting minerals, for me, it was kind of minimal. Like, uh, there, you could uh, consider certain tunnels that look like they're ready to collapse and all, all that kind of thing. You, you just take your chance because you're into something that you love. But uh, the, the real dangers that I ran into was, were in the Matagosa jungle. But that's nothing to do with collecting minerals, and uh, I can't I can't think of anything that uh, uh, would be constituted as a real danger in collecting minerals. I think it's a pretty safe way of enjoying life. One more question back here. I've always kind of wondered how you guys knew to dig there, um, who led you to the, the great pegmatites that you guys are so famous for getting all these great pieces from? How did you guys know that they were there? It's kind of asking how you, uh, I think he's speaking specifically of the Queen Mine, how you realized that that was a rich bounty and that okay. uh, that's something you should go after. Okay, this is um, a question that can be answered in a kind of a mysterious manner because I really don't know myself. But um, uh, my my travels in Brazil gave me information from what they call gar garimpeiros that are doing digging of for anything there, and they dig uh, quite often in the wrong places. But then when they dig in the right place. Then they say, well, then it was a little, it turned a little bit yellow or a different color or harder or softer or something like that. And I had tried to absorb all that information from the actual diggers. And I feel that uh, uh, knowing something about the, uh, uh, in each instance, in pegmatites, the, uh, uh, the interesting uh, uh, indicators are at least in the polypegmatites and maybe nowhere else in the world are shorals, black terminates that are over an inch in size. 
and you see something of that size, and you say, well, let's dig there, because that seems to be uh, what is leading to pockets. And if you, if, if you, and then I mentioned earlier, but if the color of the lipidolite changes, you could be in for some really good things. And I've heard two people tell me that in Brazil, that they came upon a, a, a gigantic pockets of things simply because the color of the lipidolite changes color. Well, you don't forget that kind of stuff when you're really interested in digging. And uh, uh, sometimes maybe uh, giving it due thought, you just say, damn, I got to dig this way. Like, uh, uh, there are people here now in, in Pala that uh, are, uh, that I'm envious of that are doing the same thing. And they're learning as they go through hundreds of feet in uh, uh, pegmatite, they, they, they notice certain features. And then that starts to add up. And as soon as they hit something good, they know, well, damn, it's because of it being this way or that way or something or other. And uh, it's, it's, it's nothing that is uh, taught in school. And it's, um, uh, these are just features that you learn by working side by side with, uh, with local miners that uh, are hitting or, hitting or missing. And when they hit, you find out why. Uh, it's hard to say what, 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 the, what the, that amounts to. Anybody have one more question? Okay. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> That's a good song.